we'll go ahead and get started with um, just brief introductions to who's here today, why we're here, and this project in general um, that brought us here. So um, feel free if you're comfortable and would like to introduce yourself in the chat um, to include your name, pronouns, your organization, and or the um, it affiliate or the public health association, state public health association that you are joining us from. Um, so feel free to put that all into the chat if you'd like. Um, I'll briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Raya. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a program manager at APHA. Um, and thanks again for joining us today. Welcome everyone who's put their introductions in the chat. Wonderful, and feel free to continue to introduce yourselves in the chat um, and include if you're comfortable name, pronouns, organizations, and or your affiliate. Um, or State Public Health Association. Um, I'll just give a brief overview of what we're planning to talk about today, um, and then we can jump right into it. So today, um, we'll start by setting the stage for why we're here um, and get some background on communications as it is such a vital tool for public health advocacy. When we walk through, um, then we'll walk through strategies and messaging framing specifically, um, and then we'll conclude by sharing some resources that are available to you and doing some Q&A. Um, we were lucky enough to have a number of really, really wonderful um, and relevant questions to get to that were submitted in the pre-registration form. So we'll start with those um, and then open it up to audience questions as we have time. So just a little bit of background um, on this work before we jump right in. Um, at APHA, the Affiliate Affairs and Alliance teams are working with national level partners to support the efforts of state affiliates to advocate for public health. Um, I think we can all agree that, that right now is an important time to strengthen public health powers, prevent the next pandemic, and ensure that the health and safety of our communities. Uh, we work closely with our partners at Local Solutions Support Center, LSSC, Act for Public Health and the American Heart Association and their state representatives on this project. Um, as a part of this project, we've developed a series of informative sessions, including the one we are doing right now. Um, and these sessions are really developed to address topics that we've heard um, from our affiliates and their membership that are relevant um, and important as they build their capacity to advocate for public health. Um, so I'm pleased to introduce our guests for today. Um, we have a lovely panel of folks. Um, Sarah Bartell is a senior attorney at Change Lab Solutions, where her good governance portfolio covers legal authority and preemption, the policymaking process, cross-sectoral partnerships for upstream community health improvements, um, and her work across issues addresses how we communicate the value of public health, how we incorporate the fundamental drivers of health inequities, and how we invest in um, healthier communities for all. Sarah's legal background includes um, work related to food systems, environmental health, housing, civil rights, and her JD is from Harvard Law School. Dan Rafter is vice president um, with MNR and serves as the communications team lead for Local Solutions Support Center or LSSE. Dan has 15 years of experience working with coalitions, campaigns, and nonprofits to identify winning messages, develop targeted and effective earned media strategies and drive compelling narratives in the media. At LSSE, Dan and the MNR team work with state partners to advance and develop the communication strategies that highlight the harms of abusive preemption. I'm also happy to introduce Joe Bremner, the Director of Strategic Communications and Marketing at APHA. He has an MBA in marketing from the American University. Um, strategic, the strategic communications team manages APHA's brand leads communications and marketing efforts, websites, and the nation's health, social media, and media relations efforts. Um, Joe has 20 plus years of communications and marketing experience with nonprofits focused on public health, medical devices, and middle school math, along with the time focused on PR issues for um, Ringling Bro Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey. 
um, Disney on Ice and other live entertainment products. So that's a little fun fact about Jeff. Um, Lisa Dwarak is the executive director for the Confluence Public Health Alliance. Confluence is a new strategic alliance bringing together the work of the Montana's three professional membership associations, which includes the Montana Public Health Association, the Montana Environmental Health Association, the Association uh, Montana Public Health Officials. Uh, as the executive director of the Confluence, Lisa works to make sure that professional development and policy and advocacy needs of Montana's local environmental and public health workforce are met, as well as building support for members through key state, local, and national partnerships. So uh, welcome to all of our wonderful panelists for today, and um, we will get right into it. We'll start with Dan um, with an introduction about preemption messaging. Great. Thanks, everyone. It's great to be here today. Uh, Dan Rafter, I'm the LSSC communications team lead. LSSC Local Solutions Support Center is a national hub. Um, we work to combat abusive preemption um, and support local democracy. And we provide a whole host of, of uh, support to folks, um, including communication support, research support, legal TA support. And so we're an organization, a hub that really works with um, partners on the ground to push back against preemption. We can jump to the next slide. Um, my role today is really going to focus on explaining what preemption is more broadly, and then walking folks through a high level framework of how some of our research at LSSC um, is informing how we actually talk about preemption. So some of you may have never heard of preemption before. Um, and if that's the case, you're in the right place because we're going to be talking a lot about it over the next 45 minutes or so. Some of you may have heard of it, but not have a super, you know, in the weeds, nuanced grasp of how it can be used appropriately versus when it's used uh, in, in bad ways. Um, and some of you may be legal experts on preemption. And if that's the case, wonderful and thank you in advance. Um, but the, the thing that we want to start off with all of our conversations when we're talking about preemption is that it's actually a neutral policy tool. You're going to hear me talking a lot today and others talking a lot about um, bad preemption and, and the abuse of preemption because that's a big trend that we've been seeing over the last decade or so. But preemption can be used for good, um, like with civil rights laws. You know, historically, uh, state preemption involved uh, state legislatures setting a floor that local communities and municipalities could build on with policies meant to tailor, um, you know, to meet the needs of their local communities or local residents. What we're seeing a lot more of recently over the last 10 years in particular are state lawmakers using preemption to set a very low and a very hard policy ceiling so that localities cannot enact policies beyond which um, the state provides and that is often a very very low ceiling if existent at all um, and this really dates back to reconstruction that's when we started to see preemption being used in really specific ways to harm specific communities so BIPOC LGBTQ people women immigrants working people but the last 10 years is, is when we've really seen this rise in abusive preemption start to skyrocket and a lot of that goes back to the Tea Party and the Republican wave in the 2010 elections and we saw abusive preemption really become a dominant tool in a lot of states, particularly states where Republicans secured that trifecta. So this trend of abusive preemption really started to accelerate as we got into sort of President Obama's second term. And it really reached its its sort of current peak where we are right now, um, as we, you know, as a society navigated a lot of the political and societal turmoil of the last couple of years from the COVID-19 pandemic and the public health crisis to the fight for, for Black Lives and Black Lives Matter. Um, but there's a real clear cycle of where preemption comes into play in communities, cities, counties, localities step up to the plate to address, you know, all of the myriad issues facing their constituents, they enact certain policies, and then what we see is reactionary state leaders responding with abusive preemption that takes power away from people and communities. So we can jump to the next slide. Um, Last year, LSSC tracked more than a thousand abusive preemption bills across all 50 states. And if we just go one slide further, one of the reasons that's alarming is because that is a 100% increase from what we tracked in 2021. In 2021, we tracked about 475 abusive preemption bills. Um, last year, over a thousand 
um, this year only a few weeks into the new legislative session, but I think we have no reason to believe that we're not on track to meet, potentially even exceed um, the peak that we hit last year in, in 2022. Um, LSSC does a bunch of uh, state level legislative tracking that allows us to identify trends and how abusive preemption is being used so we can see where it's happening the most. We can see what issues it's affecting the most. Um, you know, Arizona lawmakers, for example, last year proposed over 30 preemption bills in their state alone um, and passed 18 into law. In terms of issues where we see a lot of abusive preemption, we're seeing an enormous amount of harmful legislation as it relates to anti-LGBTQ bills and in particular anti-transgender legislation. We've seen a lot of preemption pop up as it relates to voting rights and democracy protections, curriculum decisions and classrooms. And of course, the reason we're all here today is we've seen an enormous amount of preemption of public health authority over the last few years as well. Um, last year in particular, we tracked 40 plus bills um, relating to public health authority preemption. And you can just see on the screen here, um, some of those bills that became law in places like Georgia and Tennessee, and, and you know what it, it pre prevents those localities from doing in those states. Um, and this is alarming for a couple of reasons. One, it's it's alarming that this became such a trend during COVID when public health officials and local leaders were taking very clear common sense steps to protect the health and safety of their local residents. It's concerning that we saw this spike in public health preemption at that exact moment. Um, but it's also alarming because it really inhibits the ability of public health agencies, officials, of local elected officials to prepare for and respond effectively to future crises. And we know as much as it's painful to think about now that there will be future pandemics, future health crises, localized public health crises that require tailored responses as well. So this was an alarming trend, not just because of, of COVID, although certainly because of COVID, but also because of what it means for how well positioned or lack thereof um, local health officials and local elected officials are for the crises yet to come in the states where their power and their authority has been severely undermined um, or eradicated. And as communicators, you know, one of our most important jobs is educating people about preemption. It's telling effective and compelling stories that help people connect the dots across all of the different issue areas and understand how preemption is being used to take power away from people and communities. And so that's why LSSC is constantly doing a bunch of message research into this uh, into this space. And if we jump to the next slide, um, we commissioned some new research and polling in late 2021 to sort of make sure we're still talking about preemption in the most updated and effective ways possible for, for all different audiences. So LSSC partnered with the African American Research Collaborative who led on this research that now really serves as the foundation for our messaging framework that you'll see here today and that you'll see in all of our resources. And the way that research came together is that AARC surveyed uh, registered voters across multiple regions of the country. So we went into states including uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, North Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Arizona, and Texas. And they also conducted a series of focus groups with participants from those states as well. And the biggest takeaway from the research, and it's really the biggest shift in how we're talking about preemption and how we're recommending folks talk about preemption, is to actually not begin any conversation you're having about preemption by trying to define what preemption is. And we, we probably know this anecdotally just from trying to explain this to people, but now we have the research to confirm it, that when we start off a conversation with someone who has never heard of preemption before in their entire lives by immediately trying to define it to them, I think we all know what happens. Their eyes might glaze over. They might start thinking about the 83 other things competing for their attention because we're all busy. We all have competing things coming at us. Um, we just lose people right off the bat if we open our conversation with trying to explain this wonky legislative concept. So instead, what you'll see in our framework in a couple of minutes is that we're now really recommending that folks begin any conversation on preemption with a specific issue area that really allows you to establish a shared value. So that sentence or that short story that gets the person you're talking to nodding their head in agreement and listening to you because they can relate to what you're saying um, on an intuitive level, on an emotional level, really going for that for that shared value. And so for, for public health authority, that could look you know, like beginning your conversation in a couple of different ways. 
you know, one of them could be talking about how one of the most sacred responsibilities of, of local officials is to protect the health and safety of their of their neighbors and their fellow community members. Um, a couple of other big takeaways from our preemption message research here is that the research tells us people are really focused more on the issues and the outcomes and how those issues and outcomes affect them in their daily lives. They're really less concerned with who at what level of government is taking what action. We know the processes of who holds what degree of power are really important, but what people care about most and, and the way that they'll be best positioned to receive information is how the issue is impacting them. Um, and then we've also learned that once people slowly learn more about preemption, that's when they are better able to understand how abusive preemption is, is part of this much broader nefarious strategy that is taking power away from people and communities. And then on the next slide, we just have a couple of other key takeaways. You can see all of this in the message guide that we'll link to at the end of this presentation as well. Um, some of these are less applicable for public health authority, but just things to keep in mind when talking about preemption more broadly. Um, it always is a, an effective way to talk about it if you're able to because of the issue to connect the impact of corporate power, or corporate greed, um, to how that's harming local governments and undermining local decision making. Um, we know that Framing the abuse of preemption as a, a way to advance racism and, and suppress power are effective frames for BIPOC audiences. They're slightly less effective for white audiences, but the difference between the two isn't, isn't jarring. Um, framing the abuse of preemption as a threat to democracy is effective across audiences because we're talking about a real undermining of local authority and local democracy here. Um, and whenever possible, it's effective to frame remedies to preemption um, as giving power back to voters or back to the community, um, as opposed to taking power away from state officials. And then let's just jump to the next slide. So I, um, some of the other folks who are presenting today are going to get into the specifics of public health authority messaging um, based on some additional research. The one thing that I wanted to make sure this group is aware of is, you know, I talked a few minutes ago about how we really view our preemption messaging is telling a story. And there's four guideposts for us in that storytelling process. The first is establishing shared values. And so we spoke a minute ago about how we'll begin our conversations by not even talking about preemption, steering clear of that, and instead really focusing on connecting with our audiences on an emotional level, on an issue that they really can understand and agree with. And then step two is explaining what the threat to that is. And that is where preemption comes in. It gives us an opportunity to talk about preemption in a bit more detail. Step three is when we step back and connect the dots for folks. And so here, we're not just talking about the preemption of public health authority and the negative and often disproportionate harms that that can have on different communities. That's just one factor, right? We're also seeing preemption of paid sick leave measures. We're seeing preemptive of preemption of uh, minimum wage, non-discrimination. So step three is where we can really help folks understand that this is part of a broader strategy to harm people um, by taking power and decision making authority away from them. And then step four, leave folks with something to do, never miss an opportunity for a call to action, whether it's contacting lawmakers, writing a letter to the editor, um, whatever, whatever the action is that your particular campaign uh, or your cause is pushing for, don't ever leave folks without the opportunity to get involved, learn more, do something to help you. And then the next slide, um, has a bunch of resources. And so I just went through very quickly um, sort of the highlights from a ton of different uh, preemption resources that we have at LSSC. And so I wanted to make sure I included here where you can find more information. I'll also drop my email into the chat um, after I'm done rambling here. Um, but we have a bunch of things that may be helpful. We do have a communications toolkit for organizers who are talking about public health authority. And that is one space where you can get a little bit more detailed. Um, it's it's from last year, but it's how, it's a messaging that LSSC developed last year on public health authority. Um, and then we also have two big resources in here. Connecting the dots is our overall message guide. And so the four step framework that I just walked through, um, if you go to the connecting dots message guide, you will get much, much, much more information and, and messaging details in that guide. We also have audience uh, specific um, frame. So if you're talking to conservatives about preemption, if you're talking to local elected officials, 
state officials, organizers, all different audiences. We have different frames for how to, how to have those conversations. And then we have issue specific preemption guides. And so whether it's public health authority, paid sick leave, broadband access, you think of it, we have a, a, a guide for how to talk about it through the lens of preemption um, at the link in the, in the slide there. So I will stop there, but I'm really looking forward to connecting with folks during the Q&A and certainly uh, afterwards, um, if I can be of any help over email or on a, on a separate phone call as well. Great, thank you so much, Dan. Um, and there are some questions in the chat that maybe um, as we move to Sarah and her presentation that you could also take a look at and potentially take a stab at. Um, one quick reminder too, that your state affiliates, um, if you're not a member of your state affiliate, are a great resource for a lot of these different strategies, um, resources, and tools. So definitely check out um, your state affiliate wherever you may reside for those resources. Um, and with that, Sarah, I will pass it on to you. Thanks, Raya. And everyone, I just want to let you know, I can't see the chat right now. So if a question comes up, could somebody flag it for me to pull up my chat? Um, so I'm going to be reporting out on some of our work with multiple research partnerships of Change Lab Solutions over the last few years, namely with Berkeley Media Studies Group, or BMSG, and the Frameworks Institute. And we partner with many organizations on this type of work. Um, I'm just sharing the research from these two. I'm also going to be moving pretty quickly um, because I want to get to the people who are using this work on the ground. I'm excited about that part of the conversation. So ask if you have any questions or you need me to slow down. Otherwise, I'm going to move at a clip. <clears throat> so we'll get some takeaways first from a research project we did with Frameworks Institute and CDC's Office of Smoking and Health. And this was the specific case of messaging and framing issues in the tobacco and nicotine prevention space. But today I'm going to zoom out and talk more broadly about some higher level findings from that work, um, more about focusing on motivating action when we're communicating about our work. And then we'll talk about these shifts in the legal structures that public health staff use to get their work done, both everyday work and emergency response, and BMSG's research on the types of messages and metaphors that can help build support more broadly and improve our work. <clears throat> So I'm Sarah. Uh, Raya, thank you so much for the introduction. And because I'm a lawyer, real quick disclaimer that I um, am not providing any legal advice today. I don't enter attorney-client relationships and I'm not lobbying. So Change Lab Solutions is a national nonprofit and we believe in advancing equitable laws and policies to ensure healthy lives for everyone. We ourselves are an interdisciplinary team of lawyers, planners, policy analysts, MPHs and other professionals. And we partner with governments at all levels and advocacy organizations and anchor institutions to invest in thriving communities wherever they are. So very short, you can read this later, we're sharing the slides, but the key is that we see policies as an opportunity for widespread, longer lasting community change. And the policy process reminds us that equity is about more than health outcomes and that each step of the process can be an opportunity for more engagement and power sharing and community voice to come through. So who are our change partners? Who are the audiences with whom we are communicating about public health laws and policies? We ask whose lives are most affected by the issue, whose work touches the issue, and who has the power to make change? And when the answers to any of these questions are uncomfortable, we gotta talk about that too. So let's start talking about framing with some high level takeaways with our partners at Frameworks Institute. This research started from a place of recognizing all of the accomplishments of the tobacco control movement in the last 50 plus years, and that some of those conversations are still circling the same old political differences, terms that have been warped and associated with invisible signs that halt the discussion before it even starts. So we worked with CDC OSH and Frameworks Institute to complete research, tens of thousands of interviews, surveys, focus groups all over the country over the course of many years to help us change the conversation. The resulting report is called Justice in the Air. You can find it on our website. There are a number of materials to support this work if you wanna dig in, um, especially if you work in tobacco and nicotine use prevention, but um, there are obviously findings here that move far broader in public health. And I'll start with this quote from Frameworks Institute's website. A frame is a guide. It directs people where to look 
and helps them interpret what they see. And every message, regardless of how it comes, comes through a frame of some kind, which to me is like framing is happening whether we do it or not. People will default to their known frames, their normal categories and ways of understanding how things work in the world, or we can be intentional about shifting the framing in our messaging to stir things up and change minds. So think of the drastic change in conversations that have happened around smoking. From the 1964 Surgeon General's report, where tobacco used to be thought of as a benign activity or even something that could be healthy to a clear health hazard. And that directly influenced people's feelings about tobacco related interventions in their communities. And now we see policy changes from smoke-free airplanes and restaurants, things we completely take for granted, age restrictions on sales and more recently restricting flavored product sales. So we know that frames can change minds. <clears throat> And Frameworks Institute and BMSG and almost every LSSC's work on this, almost every communication shop in the field will talk about the importance of shifting the frame away from an individual actor, individuals and moral failings from the portrait orientation you see here to a landscape orientation that emphasizes systems level causes and contributors to health opportunities and health disparities. This is like explain the obstacles, right? C connect to a broader strategy if we were looking back at the at the framework that, that we've seen today. So public health right now, we're all about the social determinants of health. The goal is to recognize that not everyone has the same opportunities in their lives, in their neighborhoods, to relieve stress, to avoid risk, to access what they need to be their best. Blaming individuals is also an easy way to help people justify inaction, to take no responsibility for make, making our communities fairer for all of our neighbors, no matter where they live or how much money they make or what they look like or where they get their news. Focusing on individuals also means that every argument comes down to the decision at hand, the specific trade-off between options available. And we remind ourselves that some people have far more options than others, right? So we lose sight of these underlying root causes and the environments and the interactions influencing what choices people have and why they make them. Landscape framing also helps us name and recognize historical factors that can open an invitation to talk about what really matters, to help communities feel seen, to listen to them, and to learn from them in addressing past harms and existing inequities and future goals. Frameworks report provides findings on some specific tested frames. The research um, showed which to avoid and which to advance. So on the right-hand side, you can see action-oriented can-do framing that helps people understand how the problem works and what we can all do to address it, right? It sounds just like Dan's framework. Um, health inequity, unfairness is not someone else's problem. When everyone has the same opportunity to build their best lives, when we fight together, we all benefit. And on the other side, Frameworks recommends avoiding frames that could risk blaming people who use unhealthy products or could risk making people feel hopeless or inversely that the problem is almost resolved and the problem will just go away on its own eventually. Here's a specific metaphor in the tobacco and nicotine use prevention conversation that helps shift the frame to this landscape frame while also focusing on the storytelling, on the human experience, these internal and external factors building up pressure on someone. So I leave it to the report to share more about the specific frames and messages in this context, but that has got us going um, as we dig in deeper on public health authority. So now we have partnered under BMSG, under the P Act for Public Health Initiative, which Raya introduced at the beginning. And we're focusing on the legal structures that public health staff use to get their jobs done. Authority itself is a term of art, right? And is a difficult one. So I think about like just the ability to get anything done. <laughs> Um, and BMSG and Real Language compiled a bunch of research, some tips, some strategies. We've got a webinar recorded on our website, and then they put together this beautiful report on how to talk about these issues in a highly politicized climate. And so what I'm about to share comes straight from them. This is their five tips overview. The first is let strategy dictate your message, then frame public health as indispensable, portray it using active verbs, use plain language and describe technical jargon, and finally describe how the system or the problem is currently affecting public health. So we'll go into more detail. 
First, <clears throat> the message never comes first, the strategy does. What are you trying to make happen? How is your audience, this listener, related to that goal? Which is a helpful lens, right? Our audience cannot be everyone at all times, tailoring. Effective messaging can amplify and encourage people who generally agree with you, but who don't know how to talk about the issues or specific actions to address them. And there are some people who are never going to agree with you. They're usually a minority, but a vocal one. And it's almost never a good use of time to try to convince them to completely change their minds, particularly over the course of a conversation. Next is framing public health as indispensable. And as we saw earlier, frames shape how audiences understand what the problem is and what needs to be done to fix it. When you call up frames, you are calling up concepts from, you know, that exist in their minds um, that get stronger the more you reference them. And so using metaphors can help build on some existing frames to show the value of investing in things like public health and prevention. So some examples, firefighting, health insurance, car maintenance. So we'll take firefighting as an example. In most places, firefighting like fire departments are a positive role for government protecting the greater good by pooling resources. No one can put out a large house fire by themselves and fires can spread easily and harm more people if they're not contained by dedicated firefighters. Fire departments also help communities with preventative measures like tree trimming and ventilation standards and fire exits. And they work with schools to help teach kids how to take care of themselves and those around them in fires. So connecting this metaphor to public health. Public health is a necessary part of our society. It's there for prevention, for education, for emergency response, and all of those aspects are essential and all require regular investment and maintenance and reinforcement and yes, improvement. We also wanna highlight public health strengths to underscore public health as indispensable. Don't lead with or overemphasize weaknesses, even if it's important to own them at some point. Showcasing what public health does well and what it can do for the greater good reminds audiences of its value and positions public health as worthy of um, resources. So saying the system is broken might seem effective to sound the alarm, but it could lead listeners to wonder why we should protect it. Improve it perhaps, but don't toss it out with the bathwater, right? Moreover, any weaknesses should be framed in the context of root causes and connected to specific actors. This is explain the obstacles from Dan's framework, right? What system is broken? Who and what contributed to that? So in this example, you can see rather than a further erosion of an already fragile infrastructure, we lead with accomplishments and lives saved. To frame public health as competent, confident, and active, what a mouthful, right? We're really talking about the specific language that we use. Illustrative action verbs and descriptions paint a picture. For example, urgency and progress, not just evolution, or clarity and direction, not just guidance, and activity and responsiveness. We wanna stay away from language that feels soft and equivocating and vague. And as a lawyer, I find this part particularly poignant, we can be precise about what we know. We can adhere to professional ethics without being vague. And we can show, not tell, using images of public health in action, particularly in action in group settings, not just an individual getting a shot in the arm, which can contribute to an individualistic frame, that portrait frame, but that can sometimes be undermining. So groups working together toward a larger goal. And so the example here shows active verbs and minimizing hedging from phrases like triaging and analyzing to phrases like jumped right in, stayed on the trail, urged. You can see the shift in language. The next one is obvious, but it can be particularly challenging for lawyers, but also for scientists and public health professionals. Um, it's tempting to over-describe, to get into deal, details, or be overly descriptive, use jargon or scientific terminology, plain words and descriptions. So you can compare the first examples, which happen to be legal, but I think you can probably imagine from your own work, context where it gets super jargony versus um, really straightforward examples assuring quality, so food is safe, 
to keep us healthier, healthier and safer, right? Very straightforward. Don't talk about morbidity and mortality, talk about death and disease. One note that I found interesting from their findings was if you have to include jargon, you need to briefly describe what it means, even if it makes your overall message less concise. So lean on it if you have to, but explain it. <clears throat> Finally, describe how the problem or the issue is affecting public health. So the recent bills and lawsuits that we've seen that are trying to um, block public health staff from doing what they need to do to keep communities healthy, we've got to put those challenges in context, whether they're literal legal challenges or something like industry influence or poverty or disparities in political power. So without getting in the weeds, you can still recall some basic frames that explain why something is harmful to creating the healthy, safe communities we all need and want to thrive. And the firefighter analogy works here too. The legislature wouldn't tell the fire department they need to keep fighting fires, but then they would shut down all the fire uh, hydrants in the middle of like a huge five alarm blaze. So you connect to people's common sense with metaphors. <clears throat> <clears throat> one thing to note, excuse me, <clears throat> one thing to note that as we acknowledge and listen to people's feelings and we're hearing what our communities are saying and repeating it back to them in doing our work, we have to be mindful of repeating arguments against public health measures. Uh, you do not correct misinformation by correcting the misinformation. We don't want to be a megaphone for uh, opponents of public health. What we want is to reorient people to what truly matters and what can be done about it. Get people back to those shared values and that call to action, going back to the framework from LSSC as Dan shared. So here's a recap. Um, I will let y'all look at this later. You can um, link to the report, the Act for Public Health website, if you're interested in connecting with the um, public health law organizations that are trying to facilitate that larger conversation. <clears throat> And now I wanna say before I sign off, <laughs> I'm a lawyer, I am not a communications expert. You probably noted that. And I think about this stuff all the time in my own work on law and policy innovation. And I partner with communications researchers across many issues, obviously. And I share resources with people on this stuff almost every day for their work. So I say this as an outsider, which I hope actually helps anybody on the call who's like me figuring out how to navigate this very rich field. Public health communications has been around in some way or another as long as public health has. I mean, as long as public, as long as people have talked about it, right? But the field has really come into its own like in the 90s. And there are so many expert organizations, tons of research, toolkits, uh, you know, tips, findings. Some shops focus their research and tools on audience type or by the type of activity or goal or by some issue specific findings. Often we shift our techniques depending on which partner we're talking to and the settings for all of these conversations vary so widely. So when you are sifting through the many resources that we will share with you today, I think it's helpful to keep this set of in mind and to brainstorm your own set of like search terms <laughs> because for different purposes, you might use different ones. For different issues, you might go to someone issue specific for different audiences, right? These are all valuable in myriad contexts and communities in which this work happens. And I think that's a strength of the field, um, even if it can be complicated for someone like me who's an outsider to navigate. Because I'm showing you a screenshot of this incredible list of resources that Raya and the APHA team have made available to you in APHA lead and it's incredible. Um, but just as a precursor to that, there are so many great resources and we're available to help you navigate which ones might work best for your different needs in different contexts and um, to provide technical assistance if we can help make those connections. Thank you so much and I look forward to the Q&A. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, it's wonderful that you're able to share all that you've learned from BMSG and, and all that you folks can take away from that material, as well as the <laughs> key search terms. I think that's super important. There's so many resources out there and knowing how to find the ones that are relevant to you is a very important <laughs> skill and tool. So thank you, Sarah. Um, all right, I'm gonna toss it over to Lisa and then um, we'll follow that up by chatting a little bit with Joe from the APHA team and then we'll open it up for questions. But um, I wanted to ask Lisa kind of 
in your experience working, um, you know, as an affiliate and um, with the Confluence, how have these messaging resources and these communications tools been useful to you? And kind of how can affiliates use these, basically? Thanks, Raya. Um, yeah, and in reflecting on that, you know, I really thought about where we started and what we have done over the last 10 months. It hasn't been a year yet. And so back in May, I was able to attend a version of this training that was a little bit more in depth. And I remember feeling two things, very overwhelmed and very hopeful. And I felt overwhelmed because in all of my public health education experience, there hadn't been this emphasis on this type of strategic communication. This was a new skill. It was going to require conscious effort and time to become proficient in. And it felt like there was none of that in my day. Um, but I also felt really hopeful because it really did seem to be exactly what our members needed to garner and recover support for their foundational public health work. And folks like Dan and Sarah and Raya were saying, reach out, we're here to help you. Like, here's a list of resources. We will help you figure out which one is best for you and how to tailor that. And so that was really reassuring. Um, and then I asked two board members to attend a training similar to today's, and they wear many hats. They work in small, rural, conservative health departments that they don't have a lot of support from their commissioners or their community, and they definitely don't have bandwidth for anything extra. And after they attended it, they were in some ways emotional because they're like, this is, this is exactly what we need right now to be able to communicate with audiences that are just not listening to us, right? And don't understand us. And so um, fast forwarding a little bit, we were preparing for this leg our legislative session or state legislature this last fall. And we didn't know if we would have the same level of attack on public health authority that we experienced during the 2021 legislature. So we meet every other year. Um, we anticipated other challenges, though, to our work, specifically around immunization requirements within licensed child cares and um, what non-medical exemptions could do within our communities. And so we knew for certain that we had to do as much groundwork as possible to, um, in advance of the session to really have effective messages and key messengers um, for the policy and rhetoric trends around public health authority and vaccines. And so we needed strategies that were effective for arguments such as personal choice and individual freedom and liberty, the things that, you know, Dan and Sarah have talked about. Um, and there's a lot of resources, as Sarah just showed you all, um, created for public health authority. And so we basically took a lot of that and tailored it to Montana. And then we were looking at those resources and thinking we needed something for vaccines. And so we reached out to Act for Public Health and Raya and they were able to do quite a bit of work to sort of tailor some of that. And so now we have these two toolkits um, that frame the importance of our position and concern on the issue. And so what we're really do is what we're really trying to do is be very conscious of like when we say one word, what is the legislator, the audience going to immediately think of? And how can we beat them to having that sort of preconceived story in their head with the words that we're using? Um, we developed talking points um, with the help of Act for Public Health around shared values and solutions and different angles that, you know, we think could be effective in some in finding some common ground here. Um, and what I want to share just two more things really quickly is that we have been able to share these toolkits with our state partners. So the Montana chapter for the American Pediatrics pediatricians and then our immunization immunization coalition and their minds have been blown they're like this is exactly what we need like the policy wonk pieces are great but we 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 need to talk about these things more effectively um and then we also were able to really pair this with that powerful messenger piece and so we coupled it with a power mapping project um, where we built this network of friends for public health. So sometimes these framing tools are great, but it needs to come from someone else, right? And so really have done some work to sort of pair those two pieces. Um, and I'll just emphasize that when we've reached out to Act for Public Health, we've gotten like very usable resources. It hasn't felt overwhelming. And that this took time. You know, back in May, I did feel overwhelmed and we've taken very small steps. 
And I'm just really excited about how far we've come and what that might look like in a year from now or in our 2025 legislative session. So um, just want to give a big thanks to all the partners that are here and the Act for Public Health who have made us feel equipped. Uh, fortunately, we haven't had bills related to public health authority or immunizations yet, uh, but I sure feel ready if they come. So thanks, Raya. Great. Thanks so much for sharing that, Lisa, and, and making that um, what can be an overwhelming process um, a little bit more usable and step-by-step -step, um, kind of how to how to address those things. Um, and I, you know, it, it's also wonderful to hear how you've used those resources and how you've been able to kind of parlay them into um, into other things and and how you know the 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 way that or the, the where the message comes from is really an important thing to the messenger themselves is also an important thing to keep in mind. Um, so I'll turn it over to Joe and um, from the APHA team for any brief thoughts or or anything you'd like to share. Thanks. I'm, I will not take long because I do want to make sure there's time for uh, for Q and A. Um, there have been great comments from people. Um, a couple of things I will share quickly, um, just to reiterate, um, take small steps. Don't feel like you have to tackle everything at once. Um, if you're, you know, if you're taking small steps, you're moving in the right direction and, and, and don't be afraid to, to start, um, thinking that it's a bigger challenge or a bigger thing that you can tackle. Um, so taking small steps is great. Um, again, the comment again, just to reiterate about think of who is your audience um who is your community uh and really want you want to make sure that you're using uh, language they can understand that you're truthful honest um and open um and then also as as shared um you know we want to use we want to use good language that that uh you don't that is meaningful um and, and conveys that you know, you know what you're talking about. You you know about public health. Um, so, I mean, at APHA, we'll we'll, we'll talk about um, uh, you know how we want to reflect you know the passion because there is passion involved in public health. You're you're passionate about what you're doing, um, and as has been said, there are people you will not change their mind, um, but there are lots of people who um, have questions and are open. And if there's a way to encourage conversation with them, that's wonderful because that's that's part of how things move forward. Um, I hope expect that people um, have explored through um, part of the APHA website, as there are lots of resources there. Also, um, we have policy statements that APHA puts out; those can be used on a local level. Um, for information and for reference. Um, uh, we have fact state level fact sheets. Uh, what's there at the moment is a little old, but those will be updated um, that highlight uh, some notable health measures um, within each state. Again, that can be useful, um, but I don't really want, there's been a lot of great things. I wanna make sure there's an opportunity for Q&A. So I'm gonna stop and, and just encourage people to uh, um, as you have time, don't try and tackle and go through all these resources at once, but as you have time to go through and explore and, and really uh, look at some of uh, the wealth of resources that are there and, uh, and ask for, ask for uh, help and suggestions. Great. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, and I want to open it up with um, one question that we got um, already submitted from our audience members, um, but would encourage folks to also utilize the chat. Um, and when we get through some of these um, initial questions, also to unmute and ask your questions live as well. Um, first, I wanted to um, pose a question maybe to Sarah initially and, and, and folks can um, bring in any other comments that they'd like. But first, how can communicators gain or regain the trust of their communities? I feel like <clears throat> I feel like in the context of technical assistance, the things that have been most helpful from the messaging research that we've worked with on BMSG is um, getting back to basics. The success stories that we learned in public health when we got excited about like building our careers, some of those success stories 
people just don't know that's public health. So it's getting back to basics about, you know, leading with successes, leading with the wins, go all the way back to the beginning, right? <laughs> Um, remind people that public health is in so many places throughout their day-to-day -day lives in ways they don't even see it from when they wake up in the morning and you know their pillow didn't cause them to have an allergic reaction and they drink water from the tap and you know going that type of that type of work but um, I think reminding like everybody's talking about public health now and everybody um, has an opinion about it and a lot of that is skewed toward emergency response. And so some of the bills are focused on emergency response and that's an, a rich dialogue and a frustrating dialogue sometimes to be a part of. But there's this whole other side to public health and the bills are, are affecting that authority, those basic functions too. And we have to get, remind people of all the stuff we do really, really well in the background and have done for, you know, a hundred years. What would folks say who've done this work on the ground more closely than I have? Yeah, and if you wanted to jump in and 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 share your thoughts as well, and then there's also another question that maybe you can um, jump right into in the chat as well after you're done sharing your thoughts about um, trust and regaining that trust. Yeah, I would say more broadly, so taking even a step back from just the public health space, but just approaching it from a sort of a communications 101 space more broadly, I think the two things that come to mind for me are just um, whether it's trying to build trust or regain trust that is broken, like one is reconsider who your spokesperson is or what the delivery method is. If there's a particular spokesperson who would be better suited for specific audiences, um, consider arming that spokesperson with your messaging um, and having them be the person to deliver the message. The other thing, and this came up consistently in uh, Sarah's uh, piece of the presentation as well, which I love to see is just, I think message consistency um, is so important and using the messaging in everything that you're doing, whether you're having a conversation, whether you're doing an interview, whether you're writing an op-ed, I apologize, it's my dog is barking in the background, if anyone can hear that. Message consistency and using that as an opportunity to get ahead of what you anticipate being some of your, you know, coming from your opponents and just practically get out ahead of it. Um, but whatever you do, don't waste any time, energy, elevating our opposition's messaging. I will say, this is sometimes a controversial opinion of mine, but I am not a fan of like the myth busters that you see on social media where we give all of this free real estate to our opposition. And the worst part is we do the side-by-side -side of like their message and our message and their message is more often than not like a punchy, very easy to understand one sentence. And then we have like four paragraphs. Um, it's not effective. So to the extent that you can not give attention to the, the messaging that you're trying to push back on, but get ahead of it proactively in your own messaging would be the second piece there. Great. And then um, you got a specific question in the chat about um, giving it a specific example of kind of corporate power and the authority of governments and how you make that connection. Um, so if you wanted to, to chat to that as well or speak to that. Yeah. Point. Absolutely. And I will say, I don't know, I would defer to the public health folks to know if, if the connection here is as strong for this issue. My guess is that it might not be, but I could be wrong. Um, but in a lot of issues that we see preempted, um, whether it's paid sick leave, minimum wage, um, a lot of different issues around how easy it is for you know corporations to sue cities if they don't like policies, the driving force that we see is um, big companies and their lobbyists really working with lawmakers through so groups like ALEC um, and elsewhere to really drive a lot of those bills. And so when you draw a connection for folks between why they're being harmed by this issue and it's coming at the expense of corporations who are trying to enlarge their probably already pretty healthy bottom line, that's usually a pretty effective tool. I'm not sure if it's as relevant for public health authority, but if there is that connection, it's it's good. And Sarah, go ahead. I love that um, really high level and very, very powerful moneyed example you gave of the industry lobbyists, but it also comes through for me in messaging issues a little bit closer to the local policies that might address them. So these would be lo local public health powers um, is in the healthy retail space where you've got sugary drink companies and big tobacco companies who are coming in and dictating what these 
local retailers can sell, how the stores look, where they position things in the store, who they, who else they can partner with. I mean, there's um, such a strong push for the like public health spending some policy energy to put things in place to counteract that control a little bit where there is no one else to counteract it can actually help local retailers um, envision a more community centered business model like you know consumer model that's based on residents and stuff so that's um, maybe a, a nitty gritty too close to home but one that I um, that I think also gets at the same like local voice through local public health regulations that help, um, push against these like huge, incredibly well-resourced forces that come into our communities where we otherwise just have no one. <laughs> Great, thank you for tackling those wonderful questions. Um, I just wanted to highlight one thing that um, we, we did get a question submitted around framing um, communications for anti-trans legislation and how you kind of combat that legislation and, and communicating about that. So I'm gonna drop um, a resource in the chat that Dan shared um, from LSSC to address that question. Um, and I wanted to open it up for folks. I, we, I know we've gotten some wonderful questions and, and address those from the chat, but if anybody wanted to unmute and ask a question, um, otherwise we'll head back to the list of questions we have from, um, from our wonderful attendees that have submitted them in advance. Anybody have questions they wanna ask out loud? As folks are thinking about those potential questions, um, one other question we got from, from folks um, in advance of the meeting was, what role does storytelling play in public health communications? And also kind of within that um, as well, like what role does data um, play and how can you effectively communicate that? So that's kind of a two for there about how to really effectively leverage stories and um, data sharing in your public health communications if anybody wanted to take a stab at that. I can start with the storytelling piece. Um, I mean, I think I think it's the the ball game. I think you know when we when we look at how folks are being bombarded with so much information, every conversation you have, your inbox is probably overwhelming. You know the things that you hear from your local elected officials and other people running for office. Like we're just being bombarded all of the time, um, and unless we already have a stake in an issue because of work or because of lived experience that it could be you know it can be really hard for us to give energy to something else even if we know on the periphery that it's important um it can be hard because we're all being pulled in so many directions i think the power of of storytelling um is what allows you to and this goes back to the shared values piece but it's what allows you to sort of take the issue from theoretical and it takes you from that space of oh yeah this is happening it's not great but other people are are taking care of it and i'm going to focus on this instead it's what pulls you out of that space and into the space of oh my gosh this is happening and now that i've had this conversation with you i realize it impacts my own family or i realize that it's relevant to my neighbors or my community as a whole it really personalizes um and makes you feel a bit more invested in an already overwhelming i think media just world environment in general so i think to start with storytelling and not lean into like here's the problem right away here's everything here's the technical issues the nuance is is essential to the ball game i was gonna flag that there's some tension i think for people when they consider how to shift from the portrait frame to the landscape frame they're like well i thought i was supposed to focus on like individual stories i was supposed to connect it to something real you know the human experience um, and I think the pressure metaphor from Frameworks Institute is a great example of how you can still keep it focused on the human experience and not have it be focused on individual behavior, right? That, that systemic shift, but it's still a story. So I totally second everything Dan said. And to the point about data, um, one quote I've heard that I love is no data without stories, no story without data, right? Um, that they have to go hand in hand because you risk either uh, playing into people's default biases, or you risk people just not connecting to it, so, uh, depending on which you shortchange. So I think they're really important to go hand in hand. Great, any last thoughts from, um, from anybody 
Uh, any questions that you have for our panelists or, or any panelists have any last thoughts to share with folks before we end? Hearing none, we'll go ahead and conclude. Thank you all so much um, for, for joining us today and for taking the time to learn about health communications. There are a number of wonderful questions and things that could have been an entire um, our session on their own that we got submitted. So we'll we'll do our best to share um, resources that are relevant to those. We'll share the slides and all the resources as well with you all as, as well as the recording from today's session. So um, look out for that. Thank you all so much for joining and have a wonderful day.